Bingo. We're back at 1 o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. I really love this show, Life and the Law. We talk to lawyers and people around lawyers and the law, and we try to get a handle on, on how the law is operating and how the profession is operating and, and interesting situations that lawyers find themselves in. And today we're talking to Leah Hahn. We're talking about the trust for public land, creating parks and protecting land. And she is the Hawaii State Director of the Trust for Public Land. Wait, wait, welcome to the show, Leah. Oh, well, thank you for having me. <laughs> nice to have you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about the Trust for Public Land. What is it? It's a national organization. Um, what does it do nationally, and what does it do locally? Well, it's a national land conservation organization with over 30 offices nationwide, and it's been working in Hawaii since 1979. Its first project was to expand the Volcanoes National Park. And since then, um, the Trust for Public Land has helped to conserve over 43,000 acres throughout the state. That's substantial. When, when you say, uh, I get the feeling that this is a project-based kind of or, mm -hmm. organization, and projects come to you or you develop projects, mm -hmm. and then you make, you make that land into public land or land which is dedicated for agriculture, for culture, for public use. Yes, um, yes. So in Hawaii, we have a local advisory board with representation from all major islands, including Lanai, which uh, is like, yay, we got, we got Lanai. <laughs> um, and that uh, local advisory board has helped us develop a strategic plan. Uh, we work in generally three areas, shoreline coastal lands, native lands that perpetuate Hawaiian culture, and working lands that promote Hawaii self-sufficiency. Um, recreational? Yes, and so the coastal and shoreline lands are uh, very recreational. I mean, everybody in Hawaii serves or goes to the beach, and so that's why shoreline lands are very important. Um, they're also very important to Native Hawaiian culture. Mm -hmm. Many of the practices, fishing, subsistence, occur on the shoreline. Um, a lot of our working lands projects, um, projects that protect our watersheds that produce our drinking water, yeah. also have elements of public access for hiking in the mountains. Um, and so, yes, so there's recreation. the state is your is oyster. I mean, it's all fair game, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so I, I'm just, I just wonder, I mean, give us um, a, a project that you have done in, say, 2016 and uh -huh. tell us, give us, step us through on that uh, as a sort of case study. Okay, well, I, there's two slides I think that you're No, let's look have. at them, yeah. And one uh, very, I think, important project that we worked on uh, that, um, we closed actually just a year ago in December of 2015, so just it's really a year anniversary right now, is Kuomo'o. Uh, so I don't know if you know the Hawaiian history, but in 1819 there was a very important famous battle called the Battle of Kuomo'o, which occurred on the Big Island south of Kona. There's a picture of it. Yes, him. and this is a rendering by Brooke Parker, the artist, the Native Hawaiian artist who has generously allowed us to use this image in talking about the story of the Battle of Kuomo'o. It was a battle following the death of Kamehameha I in December of 1819, and it was the battle of his son versus the battle <coughs> of versus his nephew. Um, they were fighting over the traditional kapu system, and in, after this battle, the traditional ways uh, fell away, um, and sort of the idols were abandoned, and sort of Western influences So the kapu over. system went away. Yes, yes, and so... This was after the Pali, the Pali uh, Right, Pali this is battle, after Kamehameha first The, the consolidation of the islands right. and all that. and this is approximately six months after his death. Mm -hmm. So there was sort of a bit of a power vacuum, and so it's a very important time in um, Hawaiian history, and at this site, it said that the, the forces of Kamehameha II and the opposing forces, you know, battled up and down the coast. Um, the, the forces of Kamehameha II had cannon and muskets and cannon fi mounted on... The uh, Europeans on, had already on, come on, uh, ashore. On canoes, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, and so they were overpowered, the uh, sort of rebel forces, if you would. Yeah. And uh, there are hundreds of warriors and, and chiefs and chiefesses buried on this land. And Wait, so where is it now? It's at Kumo'o, and it is south of Keho, south okay, of Kona. Okay, it's um, toward Milo Li. Right, right, okay. right. And so I had been aware of this land and its um, historical importance for quite a while, um, but luckily um, the landowner, Mrs. Shantower, and if you show the next picture, you'll see a picture oh, of Mrs. Shantower. Okay. She's um, a part Hawaiian native lady. This is her ohana, but um, to the right, or I, mean, I can't really tell which is right, 
um, but on the is, right of the picture. <laughs> to yeah. the right of the picture yeah. is the famous musician Keola Beamer and his wife Moana. Mm -hmm. So Keola Beamer um, is a descendant, of course, of Nona Beamer, his mother, um, who's named after the chief ass who died in this battle, Manono. And um, he, for many, many years, generations really, had, had vis visited this land. Um, the stories and chants and hulas um, of the battle were handed down to him by his mother. He really wanted to preserve it. Um, Mrs. Schatower, um wanted to preserve it as well for educational purposes, but she needed a little bit of economic return to, uh, for her family and her future. And so we were able to figure out uh, a price and raise the money. And now uh, a nonprofit that is formed by the Beamer Ohana um, owns and stewards the property. Um, over the past year, they've had hundreds of volunteers uh, restoring native vegetation along the coastline, um, honoring sort of the native practices, trying to connect with the families of those who fell in the battle and who were buried on along uh, the coastline. So, so it's, a coast, it's coastal land, yes. and as I recall, the topography is a, is a sort of a drop-off in that area. Right. It's a uh, bit of a sea cliff yeah. if you go south of Keho Bay. Yeah. Um, but uh, to the south and to the north of this property are, are very large luxury homes and then the development Hokulia. So this is a, a welcome respite in that um, yeah. development as of the Kona area. The highway, yeah. So this is a more natural. And so, um, uh, how how much acres are we talking about here? Forty-seven acres. Forty-seven okay. acres. And that's, this is an example of the kind of projects right. that the trust uh, does. Yes. So you raise the money, you mm -hmm. organize uh, somebody who will steward the land, right? And and uh, you create the documents, I suppose right. that. Um, that 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 define that stewardship, mm -hmm. and then you then you're done. And then we transfer it. But mm -hmm. we're we're constantly checking in with Kila Beamer and his nonprofit Aloha Kuomo Aina about their progress, um, referring them to different funding sources that we think that might be able to. Uh, are are assist you part them with the of the, the documents? I mean, are you a party? Um, yes. When we buy land, we're usually a party to it, but then we eventually transfer it to the mm -hmm. sort of ultimate steward of the land. <clears throat> so when you say you, you check in with uh, Keola, you, you're, you check in and, and to see whether he's doing the cultural things that were agreed at the, at the time of the transaction. Um, we're not in that formal role as a monitor of the restrictions on the property, more of an informal role mm -hmm. and sort of assistance and supporter. Uh, but there are restrictions on the land that um, prevent it f from being developed. Um, in that particular instance, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs donated quite a bit of money to the purchase price, and they are the monitor of the restrictions. Ah. Yeah. <clears throat> so what, what uh, sort of restrictions are there? He, uh, the trust, I mean his trust, his nonprofit, I guess, mm -hmm. Um, is supposed to conduct uh, Hawaiian culture education on the mm -hmm. land. Is that what, what have they done? What are they doing? Well, um, yes, the, the restrictions against development, so it can't obviously be developed into luxury homes. And, and that's and that and runs things. with the land, and that's that, title. Yes, that runs with the land, um, it's permanent. Uh, and so he um, is running sort of a cultural education uh, program. He has a wonderful young woman, Kamuela Mehiula, who is the program coordinator, and she has already um, invited several, you know, not several, but dozens of groups from different schools and halau, hula halau, to come over and to help with the restoration and to learn about the story of Kuomo'o and the history. Yeah. Um, it's also part of the Alakahakai National Historic Trail, which runs through uh, roughly three quarters of the Big Island, the coastal trail that the National Park Service administers. So they're also partnering with the National Park Service. Is that, is that on the Mackay side yes. of the road? Yes, Mackay side So that would be very, um, you know, beautiful area, yes, I Yes, yes. So I've, I've walked it many times, and it's, it's rocky, but it's really, really beautiful. Um, and um, they've been partnering with the National Park Service on trail restoration and signage and things like that. So this is in perpetuity. Yes, it is in perpetuity. So this is the kind of thing we need to do to preserve the essence of Hawaii. Right, right. right. That's part. Of, so, but that you know, the, <clears throat> your national organization mm -hmm. then is, is, is um, dealing with very local mm -hmm. cultural experiences like this. Yeah, so. I mean that's the great thing about the Trust for Public Land. It brings its real estate, 
legal and conservation experience um, lo to that local to, to local issues. So the conservation that we do in Hawaii um, is very meaningful to Hawaii, but um, we're doing very meaningful and it looks slightly different con conservation in Montana or yeah. Colorado yeah. or uh, you know recently we added on to Yosemite Park in, in California. So it's, you know, we, we do great work all over the nation. So now you, you were um, an environmental lawyer. Yes, for I was. A, a firm on Bishop Street <laughs> and uh, got into all kinds of things, I mean, in that, in that, in that specialty. Um, and so now you, you bring a certain legal experience to yes. the Trust for Public Lands. Um, what, what do you do as the director of the, of the trust here? Well, a lot of it is um, just sort of working with uh, communities and landowners as that bridge, right? Uh, so you said some of our projects come from communities that say, we don't want this land to be developed, please help us save it. Um, and then on the other hand, um, we work with landowners who you know, have to be willing sellers. So it's all voluntary uh, work that we do. Landowners have to voluntarily give up their rights, voluntarily sell their land. And so we're often the bridge between a very, maybe sometimes upset, hurt feelings local community and the landowner who may feel like, why are, who are these, you know, other, you know, people in the community that are against me? Yeah. You know, so we provide that sort of bridge and we negotiate with the landowner. We try to work out um, some kind of transaction or deal that meets his or her needs um, and then raise the money needed to make it happen. It's always with a view toward conserving the land. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, do you, have, you know, it's a legal practice question. Do you ever try a negotiation and it doesn't work? <laughs> and then yes. the people back out or something? What happens? Yeah, I mean, it is voluntary. So if there are, um, there are many times where uh, a project does not close, I think, and there's this motto at the Trust for Public Land where it takes like a thousand cups of coffee to close a project, <laughs> you know. That's perfect. And, so, <laughs> um, and sometimes uh, it, might be not, it might not be the right time for the landowner um, or the market. And then a few years later, you know, we're back talking, we're, we're checking in with them. Are you still interested? This was, this was something like Mrs. Shaw Tower and the Komo'o project because she very strongly wanted a Hawaiian organization to own and steward that land. And so we approached different partners like Kamehameha Schools, like the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, like the National Park Service. And for one reason or another, those partnerships um, were not attractive to her. Mm -hmm. But she met Kayla Beamer, and I don't know if you know Kayla, but um, you know, basically fell in love with him because yeah. who, who, doesn't, yeah. who doesn't fall in love with <laughs> right. Kayla Beamer? Um, and that's it, you know, was the right partnership and his, you know, strong connection to the land through his family. It's was, a match made in heaven. Was, was just amazing. Yeah, so yes. th that would be something you do. You try to make mm -hmm. matches mm -hmm. like that. Yes. So everybody is on the same page. Yeah, yeah. we're the e-harmony of yeah, e -harmony. land yeah, conservation. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, okay, aside from the, you know, the, the cultural process on the Big Island, what, you know, um, can you can you do this kind of project, say in Oahu, where there's not so much uh, remote land? Well, I think actually the major a lot of our projects Is that are right? on Oahu. Um, this year, we closed several projects on Oahu: the Turtle Bay Malka Agricultural okay. Land Project, our Whitmore North Agricultural Land Project with the State Agribusiness Development Corporation and Dole. Um, and uh, we're working very hard to close our Ka'ivi project, Ka'ivi Coast Malco Agric Lands. Um. Okay. When we come back from this break, Leah, Leah Hong. Mm -hmm. She's the uh, state director of the Trust for Public Land, a national uh, nonprofit organization that preserves and conserves land. Uh, when we come back from this break, I want to talk about those projects. Okay. So we'll do some more case studies with you <laughs> and get the depth and breadth of what you do. All right. We'll Thank be you. Right, we'll be right back after this break. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on ThinkTech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what is likable about science. We bring on scientists of all ilk, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists, ecologists, and they talk about their work, and more importantly, they talk about why you should talk about their work, why you should think about their work, why you should like their work. I help them bring out why their work is understandable, why it's meaningful, 
why people should care about it, why people should support science. We have a good time. We talk about current uh, events of interest. We talk about uh, historical events sometimes. We dig deep into their research, why they do, what the joys and delights and frustrations of their work are. And in all, we, we show a, a real world of science, a real world of likable science. I hope you'll join us every Friday at 2 p.m. Okay, we're back. We're live with Leah Hong. She's the state director of the Trust for Public Land. And we're talking about the depth and breadth of the projects that that organization is doing around the state of Hawaii. And you have a, you have a, a number sheet here. Oh, uh, yes, we and, do. Uh, can you give us a, a handle on the depth and breadth according to the numbers? Okay, well, thanks to our wonderful uh, administrative assistant, Chanel, we have this wonderful by the numbers. Um, so we've been conserving land in Hawaii for 37 years, since 1979. Um, to date, we've collaborated with over uh, 20 community landowner and governmental partners to protect 31 special places across our island home, uh, permanently safeguarding over 43,000 acres and counting. And this work would not be possible without the support and aloha of our 6,000 um, supporters and donors uh, throughout the Hawaiian Islands. So you have supporters and donors in the Hawaiian Islands? Yes, we do. Who, yes. who give you money and otherwise yes. help you? Yes, volunteers, yeah, sweat equity, and also uh, um, cash donations. Yeah, uh, okay, that's for, uh, oh, so land also, land and, land. and cash, yeah, yeah. perfect. <laughs> well, I mean, the idea, I mean, I was telling you before the show, the land, uh, the idea is that it's about public space, it's about public land, and we, mm -hmm. We can't let all of that go away, especially mm -hmm. in, a, in an island state where the amount of land is limited. Mm -hmm. We need it for quality of life, quality of cerebral life, physical mm -hmm. life, economic life. Um, and so you stand as a sort of barrier between losing it all. <laughs> <laughs> and so what you're doing is, is very important. Thank you. So, so I want to turn to uh, I want to turn to the agricultural kind of project. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Turtle Bay and right. uh, agribusiness kind of project. Can you give us a, a case study of that one? Well, um, there's a picture that your your technicians have of the Turtle Bay Malka agricultural lands. Okay. And in April of this year, mm -hmm. we recently is that it now? Yes, yeah. we okay. recently recorded uh, agricultural conservation easement over 468 acres of this agricultural land which permanently dedicates it to agriculture, meaning it cannot be subdivided into gentlemen estates, it cannot be developed, it, it will permanently stay in agriculture. How, how does this differ from other state characterization zoning maybe, or mm -hmm. you know, the designation of, of land as conservation land, or mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how, um, how concrete it is, but the, that's a bad word to use, how, 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 how structured it is to call mm -hmm. land agricultural land mm -hmm. and expect it to stay agricultural land. Well, well these uh, your system is be different. It, it is it is not zoning. It is um, a document called an agricultural conservation easement that is recorded in the Bureau of Conveyances that permanently restricts the land. It runs with the land. Um, so if it, the property is ever bought or sold or inherited uh, to another a person um, that those restrictions would continue. Could you ever um, undo that? Only in very um, unusual circumstances, things like an act of God that might destroy the uh, resources for which the easement was created. Interesting. Right. So for uh, you know, for, for some wild example, you know, maybe you know this agricultural land is near the coastline, but. What if this enormous tsunami, you know, washed all the dirt away so that it was barren rock? and it had no agricultural value. Then mm -hmm. maybe something as extreme as, as that, maybe mm -hmm. the restrictions could mm -hmm. be lifted, but it has to be very extreme. Would you have to go to court to get that yes, straightened out? Yes, the court yeah. would have to approve it, yeah. 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 Okay, so now this, this document uh, creates an agricultural easement. Mm -hmm. Easement is a, is a word that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really connote the gravity of, of the change, though. Right, right. It's real serious and it's real forever. Yes, yes. <laughs> you, well, you and I went to law school and we know that real property is described as a bundle of sticks, right? Yeah. And so you're, the landowner is literally giving away sticks. I'm giving away this right to subdivide. I'm giving, you, I'm giving away the right to request a change in zoning. 
uh, I'm giving the right to, uh, away the right to request a change in the land use classification. Uh -huh. So I'm giving, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's an agreement. It's a voluntary uh, agreement by, by the, the land. By the owner. By the, the owner. Is there another party to it, or is it just the owner? Well, there are other parties to it. Um, the conservation easement holder is usually a public agency or another land trust organization. That could, it, could it be your organization? It could be. It could be ours. Um, we occasionally do serve in that role, um, and that is um, a sort of monitoring role, where every year you go back to the land and you look at the restrictions and you kind of keep a running, running report of well, you know. Here are where all the sheds and buildings are, and have they complied with all the restrictions not to build houses, not mm -hmm, to not mm -hmm. to pave over everything, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So why would a, a landowner do that? Because he's he's you know he's cutting down the value mm -hmm. for resale, for development, for subdivision, mm -hmm. all that. Right. But why would he do that? Well, there's a number of different reasons. Um, there are some um, significant tax benefits for uh, conservation easement donations. Um, there are also uh, programs that reimburse the landowner for the fair market value of the rights that he's giving away. And so it is a bit of a complicated appraisal question, but um, appraisers can estimate the value of the right to all these rights or the sticks that the landowner is giving away and put a value on that. And there are programs that exist to reimburse the landowner for yes. Again, for you would raise money. Yes. And you'd pay the, the uh, landowner. It would be voluntary. Right. You'd have to be willing to do it. And the money would have to be enough to satisfy him, I, I expect. And an appraisal would help him right. feel that it's in the ballpark right. anyway. And the money comes from various sources. One of the um, wonderful things that the Trust for Public Land has done in Hawaii is help to lead uh, the establishment of land conservation funds throughout the island. So every single county, government, and every and the state have a land conservation fund. Um, and so I think that over the last, since 2002, has helped to raise maybe close to $200 million mm -hmm. for land conservation, not just for the Trust for Public Lands projects, but mm -hmm. for land conservation in general, statewide. And you'd be one of the beneficiaries, yes. your projects. We huh? can apply for it and compete um, mm -hmm. uh, in open and transparent processes um, for those for those monies, just like any other organization. But you might go somewhere else, too. You might go to one of your donors yes, or we, a number of them and, um, and, and find the, the funds there. Right. Right. And then there are federal sources of money, and I think establishing those local sources of money has really helped the land conservation movement in Hawaii in the last 10 to 20 years, because the federal government has had programs for land conservation for, for many, many years, but they all require a match. They'll, they'll fund up to 75%, but require a 25% local match. And so the state was always hampered by the fact that they didn't have a dedicated mm. source of land conservation money, and now they do, and now they can make these matches, and all these conservation uh, projects can happen now. Yeah, uh, just footnote question is you you may know that we have a new president elect, mm -hmm. you know. right? Right, <laughs> and he has different ideas about so many things, yes, including yes. environmental issues. Well, we'll see. You know, his interior department pick was. Um, was was very encouraging okay at least from the land conservation so, standpoint so you don't see um, necessarily see a, a loss of funding on the national level as a result of his administration well um, I think the president-elect has always been in favor of these sort of voluntary private landowner incentive programs um, I think he's expressed in his past uh, dislike of regulation regulation but most of the land conservation programs are sort of these voluntary incentive-based um, programs that um, give landowners an incentive to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. And so um, he has been generally supportive of that. Hope so. Of. I mean, he's a, he has a secretary. He appointed a treasury secretary who is into saving money mm -hmm. and will cut programs <laughs> wherever he can. <laughs> So this might be one. Okay. Um, in any event, uh, back back from our digression. Okay. Um, so in I'm trying to remain hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we just have a schmooze here, you know. <laughs> so 
uh, back to the agricultural uh, program at Turtle Bay. Right, right. Um, so now it's 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 closed. It right. happened. It happened. It's in place and it's perpetual. Right. And I guess the landowner who did receive some money or is receiving some money mm -hmm. for the the bundle of rights that he sold. Mm -hmm. um, he still has the uh, the land, mm -hmm. uh, the control of the land, to lease it to an agricultural tenant or tenants, right? right? That's correct. So now we have agriculture. Right. And, he, and that landowner has really actually invested a lot of resources in improving the irrigation to the, um, to the agricultural lots. Um, they hired an agricultural consultant named Wendy Gady to help all the farmers on the on the leased lots to improve their agricultural practices and their business plans. Um, I know they're trying to find uh, partners to maybe create kind of a cooperative or a food hub or some sort of uh, facility to help the farmers do the, in, the sort of food safety processing and certification processes that are becoming um, more important. So this sets a whole bunch of other things in mm -hmm. motion. Yes. It's not just an agricultural easement. Mm -hmm. It's a whole industry of agriculture now is created on that land. Well, now that the easement is on the property, it has no speculative value for development, yeah, right? So now, now the landowner really has an incentive to invest in the ag long-term agricultural future of that land. Can you hold this uh, up for our camera? Oh, sure. That camera over there. Can we can we get in tight on that? It's a map of um, all of the. Uh, we can see it. Okay, wait one just one second. Oh, there it is. Okay, it's a map of um, of all of the many projects over the years that the uh, Trust for Public Lands has done. You can see they're all over the islands, um, and so I I, uh, I have a question based mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. You know. Like, a going forward question. We've only talked about two of them here as mm -hmm. case studies, but there are mm -hmm. many, many, many more and, and uh, different kinds. Mm -hmm. um, where is it? Is it going as fast as you want it to go? Is it going as fast as we want it to go? No, I, I, there's always more demand for our services than, than our capacity. Um, so we're constantly juggling you know, I think it's 18 to 20 different projects at any given moment, uh, our office. Um, and we only have um, two uh, project managers that work on projects, and then I do a little bit of project work myself. So it's a, it's a, it, it, there's a lot more demand for land conservation um, and securing those special places that make Hawaii, you know, our home than then there is capacity to do it all. If you, if you wanted to do more, if you wanted mm -hmm. to do enough so that you could conclude and people around <laughs> you could conclude that, yes, this is working, you know, to the, to the maximum effect, mm -hmm. what would you need to do that? Um, you know, definitely probably a lot more uh, staff in terms of just project managers with the expertise to do these transactions. But also I think um, an appreciation by by public officials of the importance of uh, land conservation to really everybody uh, in Hawaii, residents and visitors. Um, you know, it is what makes Hawaii special. It is why we have such a vibrant visitor industry. Yeah. So um, these, you know, vistas, these these watersheds, these waterfalls, open these spaces, beaches, yeah. these open spaces, these cultural places that make Hawaii what it is um, are really important to, to, you know, to, to my parents, to me, uh, you know, to the next generation, so, yeah. And to our collective psychology. Yes. And spirituality. Yes. You know. So um, my last question for you, Leah, is uh, where is it going in 2017? Can you give us a little pre and, um, you know, what you have in store? What well, you have sure, planned? sure. Um, I think there's a picture of, well, there's, I think there's a picture of a recent closing and then two other pictures of a couple. I want to look more. at them. So um, this is a picture of our recent, a very recent um, blessing celebration of a closing event at Kaliolī, the fishing village, um, uh, south of Pu'uhonua Ohonaunau. It's the first acquisition by the National Park Services 
Alakahakai mm -hmm. National Historic Trail. They should do many more. Right. <laughs> and so many of the descendants of that area mm -hmm. um, came together to bless the land um, and uh, to, you know, welcome people to the trail, which is open to the public. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, one of um, our many projects on the Big Island. So, but in 2017, we have a lot of great projects coming up. So if you go to the next picture, yeah, okay. um, you'll see one of um, our projects that we hope that will close in 2017, which is the Ka'ibi Coast Maoka Agricultural Lands. The two parcels that total over 180 acres are in brown. And this is, you know, kind of the last undeveloped pieces of that whole Ka'ivi shoreline that has been uh, at the center of controversy for many, many decades. Where, where is it? Uh, East Honolulu, mm -hmm. right, near Sandy Beach. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah. So if you're standing kind of on Sandy Beach and kind of looking up, it's kind of Malka uh, uh, past the golf course. Yeah, okay, it's just as you turn up right. toward uh, Hanama Bay. Right, yeah. right. And so, um, uh, uh, we're hoping that shortly we'll be able to close that with some state and county money that we purchase, uh, that we that we applied for, uh, and purchase the property. Um, that property will be going to the Livable Hawaii Kai Hui, um, or uh, which which is the umbrella group for the Kaivi Coast Coalition. Okay. Yeah. Important. So next next, next slide. Next slide. That's uh, that's the view of the land from the shoreline, the KEV shoreline. Makapu. So Makapu Lighthouse is Makapu. to your uh, right. That was yeah. my reference, Makapu. Yeah. Just yes. as you turn to go to Makapu. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this is really uh, sanctuary land. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful land. And it's it's uh, and threatened land. It's, it's it's really a beautiful coastline, and and really thanks to the the vigilance and hard work of just so many community members from East Honolulu. There was a big gap in, in funding, and so the community came forward, and we actually raised more money uh, than we needed, although now we're kind of using some of that money because we actually had to buy it outright and hold it and finance the purchase until the state and county monies are ready to um, be you know, released. So we're just hoping that those monies will be released um, as quickly as possible so we can we can close that. What important work you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, as an environmental lawyer, and I know you were always committed to environmental causes, um, but you probably have a tremendous amount of gratification doing this work. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, I'm so humbled and so, um, you know, pleased that uh, I'm, I'm, I've been able to work for the Trust for Public Land. It's just been an honor to work with the communities that we've worked with and the just dedicated volunteers and people uh, throughout the state who, who just want to, you know, uh, conserve their special places throughout the islands, you know, so. Yeah. Open space, public space, public land, critical to our collective mm -hmm. state of mind. Thank you for protecting us, Leah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you for asking me. Thanks for coming on. All right. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. <laughs>